Welcome to our webinar today. We um, are pleased to be able to present some updates in Atasca Software version 9.1. We have today making the presentation, Dr. David Russell. Uh, he's going to be presenting what's new in Atasca Software with a focus on fluid flow logic. David is Atasca's chief software architect with a background in mechanics and fluid dynamics. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation today. Uh, if you have a question, please ask it at any time. Uh, you can just click on the Q&A icon at the top of the uh, Teams application. All right, David, if you'd like to take it from here. Um, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, as Dave said, my name is David Russell and I'm gonna try and show you some of the new stuff we've been adding to FLAC 3D. Um, I am sort of daring the gods of software demos right now by choosing to do most of this live in the code. Um, so hope, um, we'll see how this works out. Um, and as, as such, I'm going to close off some of these windows that we normally leave open to work with, the project area and the command area and even the tools area so we can maximize the text size um, and the plot so you can see what's going on. Um, first off, uh, we're going to be working with a version of a model that was sort of cobbled together for the purposes of this de live demonstration. Um, the geometry comes from uh, a curved slope factor safety example, and you can find that if you go to our new examples dialog. Um, this we've revamped. The, the way you can find examples. So this is the complete list of all Flack 3D examples, and you can just search here. Um, that'll scan not only the titles, but also the contents, data files, and documentation. You can click on it and open it. And then you can actually bring up that example. Um, it'll open it up in a new location, along with the example right up here, you can see. So you can read all of the example notes and details. But we're not going to actually be using that example right now. I'm just using it as sort of a starting point. Uh, I want to note that for those of you listening, we are actively interested in feedback. One of the goals of these changes was to make the fluid mechanical interface simpler and easier to use and understand. So if you have any feedback on these points, we're quite interested to hear it. Um, what we should name things, what the default should be. Um, what kind of tools should be available? You just let us know and we'll note it down. This webinar is targeted at existing Flack 3D users who are interested in changes from 9.0 to 9.1. That said, if you are unfamiliar with Flack 3D, you will find a lot that is interesting here and it, and it shouldn't be completely overwhelming. Um, you should understand pretty much everything that's going on. Um, another note I want to make, and this is for old Flack, for people people currently using Flack 39, is that while there are a lot of new commands and syntax I'm going to be showing you, all old data files and all old save files remain 100% compatible. Your data files, your old data files will run in 9.1 completely as before. Your save files will restore into it as before. Um, some of the commands that exist that you were using in iPredo have been deprecated meaning they're no longer documented, but they will still work. Um, we have not violated data file compatibility. Um, so let's um, talk some about setting pore pressures. So in many models, you're interested in actually doing fluid flow calculations. You just want to set a pore pressure field for the purpose of calculating effective stress. And we have made some changes to that as well. And the, uh, before you would use the zone grid point initialize pore pressure command or the zone water command, we have consolidated that around zone grid point pore pressure. So everything that just sets pore pressure should go through the zone grid point pore pressure command. Now, if you're interested in that, I want to remind you of the interactive help. If you look at this arrow on the right hand side of the text, you can click that or you can hit control space and it looks at the cursor and brings you up to a command tree where you can browse what commands are available. I highly, highly recommend using this. It's been um, improved and updated since it first came out. So if you haven't looked at it recently, you should take in another view. 
It is a very nice way to browse what the command trees are and what's available at every level. And you can even use it to create the commands by just hitting enter. It'll insert that keyword into the command processor. So you can use it as a command builder as well. Also note that if you're interested in the details of anything he in here, you can just, for instance, the pore pressure keyword, if you just hit F1, it'll bring you directly to that documentation for that command or even that specific keyword. Um, and you can browse it and read the details on what's going on. And I'll be doing that quite a lot as we go through to show you details of what's happening. You don't have to do that F1 through that interactive um, command help. You can also just hit F1 directly in the editor and it will bring you to that command here. Um, so you can see what, what's available and read details about how it works. Um, so one of the things is the zone grip point pore pressure initialized command is the exact same as the old zone grip point initialized command, except it by default cuts off values at zero. So you can see that negative were cut off automatically um, because often negative pore pressures aren't what you're interested in for the purposes of figuring out an effective stress. If you want those negative pore pressures, you can put them back by changing the cutoff value, which defaults to zero. And then as you can see here, you get negative pore pressures again. But often calculating, specifying pore pressures with a, a value and a gradient can be a little cumbersome and you have to do some math. Um, instead, if you've specified gravity and you've specified the fluid density, um, and here's how you specify the global fluid density. You can now specify the pore pressure field in terms of head. So what I'm going to do here, and this is another trick for those of you who might not have seen it, is you can highlight commands and right click and just run those commands separately. You don't have to run the whole data file if you don't want. I'm going to be doing a lot of that for the purpose of demonstrating what commands do. Also, there's a hotkey as you can see here, control shift E. So if you don't see me actually click run selection, that's because I'm using the hotkey for time. In any case, the zone grip point pore pressure head command um, sets the head at 20, which means that the water with the default datum of zero, which you can change. Um, and again, if you hit F1 here, you'll see all the options available to the head command. Um, right here. Uh, also, um, so it just sets the level at 20 and it figures out the gradient for you. As before, you can specify a plane in space. Um, um, and you can also, using the pore pressure geometry command, you specify a table below an arbitrary geometric surface that you might have from some CAD data somewhere. And if we go to the plot items, so you can see that here, this is a geometric surface. Um, one um, little handy thing we've added there is that you can uh, import that file, use it, and then throw it away automatically using the file name keyword. So that's what's going on here. Um, and that sets the pore pressures below that geometric surface I showed you before. Another thing we've done recently is the ability to import from an arbitrary pore pressure field you might have gotten from outside. In this case, a CSV file. Um, and if you can look at that here, and it's just a point cloud of points in space and pore pressures, and that is used to specify this pore pressure field you're seeing on the right. Uh, and another important note to, point, to make about all of these ways of setting pore pressure is that uh, when you're setting initial conditions, um, you want to just set the pore pressure field and have it not affect your stress field. Um, FLAC 3D works in total stresses, and when you set pore pressures by default, it does not change the total stresses. It changes the effective stresses. If you want to keep the effective stress constant instead, and therefore change the total stress, you can use the effective keyword on pretty much any of these commands that sets pore pressure. So here, we're going to reset it to zero. Um, we're going to specify um, model and properties and initialize a stress field. Drag this down a bit. I'm going to split below and down here, I'm going to put a stress plot. Whoops. Wanted that down. I want OI. 
up here I want the poor person plot. There we go. Now, um, we've initialized the poor pressure field. We've got stresses here. So now when I do this command with the effective keyword, it's going to change both, as you might have noticed when I did it. Um, uh, and that's what I want to talk about, except for one minor note. Um, again, to make it easier to make data files, um, for instance, you can hit F1 here on the assign considerative model command and get a complete list of our considerative models. And if you're not interested in trying to memorize all the properties available, you can hit, you can, uh, not F1, you can hit control space or this arrow here, and you get a list of considerative models. And then if you click, you get a list of the properties in those considerative models. Um, and if you don't know what they do, you can hit F1 and it not only brings you to the property description and its units, but the full constitutive model write up. So you can read about the constitutive model and educate yourself on exactly what that property does and how it affects material behavior. Okay, now up to now, we've just been setting port pressures. Now we're actually gonna configure the code for flow calculations. Now we've changed the command to do that. In the past it was model configure fluid. Now you say model configure fluid flow. Those are two separate commands. And the reason why we did that is because it allows us to change the defaults without breaking data file compatibility. The defaults in model configure fluid flow are different than they were before. And the idea again is to make things simpler and allow you to add complication yourself, but start off in the simplest place possible. So when you do model configure fluid flow, unsaturated flow is off. Everything's linear pore pressure and pore pressures are allowed to go negative and saturation is always one. Um, we still change how density is calculated. Model configure fluid flow does activate a wet density calculations. So it does include porosity and fluid density in the overall density of the material, but it does not include saturation by default. So saturated, it's assuming to be always saturated for that purpose. Saturation is always one. Another change is that effective stress calculations are cut off at zero. So while you might have negative pore pressures, they are not included for the purpose of calculating effective stress when it's sent to the constitutive model. And finally, two-way coupling defaults to off. So mechanical volumetric changes do not affect pore pressures. All of these are things you can turn on again later, and you can even turn them on zone by zone. They're all properties, and I'll be talking more about that later. Um, another change is that there's no need to specify a fluid constitutive model. It, it's automatically on and defaults to linear isotropic or anisotropic depending on the permeability settings. So um, that's just there automatically. The zone fluid C model assigned command still exists because you can make zones inactive in flow. I forgot to run this so that you can see here. Um, uh, here you go. You, you can make zones inactive in flow. So when I ran that command, it made this area inactive. That makes essentially zones impermeable. It does not change the current pore pressures, but their pore pressures won't change due to pore calculations, due to flow calculations. And you can run this command to turn them back to, to the default constitutive model. Um, so now let's talk about you've got flow configured. Now you want to set your fluid flow model properties, um, and we've made some improvements there as well. All properties are set in the zone using the zone fluid property command. Everything goes to the zone fluid property command. Um, there are some values that are actually used in grid points. They end up being volumetrically averaged. You can query them at grid points using fish or with the plotting, but they're set at the zones. Um, another thing we've done is we have deprecated use of the keyword permeability to specify the permeability of the system. Uh, that's because this was this historically caused a lot of confusion um, among different people in different fields over what permeability actually means. There are different conventions, whether it's intrinsic permeability or mobility coefficient where dynamic viscosity is included or hydraulic conductivity. They all kind of refer to it as permeability, and it was it caused problems in support and confusion. So we just got rid of it. Um, we now document mobility co permeability will still work, but we document it as mobility coefficient to be very clear what it, exactly it is. Um, and if you hit F1 again, 
here, you can see it, it documents what that is and how it relates to other measures of permeability. Um, you can also, however, just specify it as a tensor. So again, if you go to mobility coefficient tensor, if you click on the T here, it will give you documentation of all the ways you can specify a tensor quantity. Um, in this case, we're specifying it by components, X and Y is one and Z is the other. And that automatically changes it to an anisotropic uh, fluid flow model. Um, there's no need to specify one way or the other. And you can also specify hyd hydraulic conductivity in terms of meters per second. Finally, um, there are now three ways to specify fluid bulk modulus. As before, you can do the fluid modulus or the Beal modulus, but you can also specify it via consolidation coefficient. And if this is a thing you often get from field measurements, and if you hit F1 here, you can see um, in the documentation how consolidation coefficient relates to things like Beal modulus or fluid modulus. Note that consolidation coefficient relates both permeability and fluid moduli. In our code right now, it, it, it considers the permeability is constant. The consolidation coefficient is just used to specify the fluid modulus. Also, there are indirect ways to set or adjust your fluid modulus. There's a command here called zone fluid modulus automatic. What that does is, is it specifies fluid modulus as a ratio of the material um, confined modulus in order to reach a diffusivity that will give you a relatively accurate transient without having the fluid modulus so high it causes needless uh, a needless time step reduction. Um, note that if you've already specified a fluid modulus and this would raise it, it doesn't do it. It only adjusts modulus down, or if you haven't set a modulus at all. Um, and as a side note, um, because in this case it doesn't do anything, it gives you a warning. Um, in the command processor now, if you have seen a warning and you know about it and you want to disregard it, you can put an asterisk at the beginning of the command, and that suppresses the warning. Um, we're trying to keep you from being trained to ignore warning messages. So if you've noticed a warning and you've seen it, you can deliberately suppress it and it won't show up when you run the data file. Another way of specifying the fluid modulus is with modulus scale. If you're running a decoupled analysis um, and you're running fluid only calculations, you need to include the effect of material compliance in that. And you can hit F1 here and you can see um, um, what that relation is and exactly how it scales it. It basically does a parallel calculation between actual fluid modulus and material compliance. Um, um, but we'll be showing that later on. And then again, there are a bunch of other properties. Porosity and fluid, fluid density are there just like before. Porosity is 0.5 by default. Fluid density can be used to override the global one. If you specify it, it uses this value in that zone instead of the global value. You can set your BOF coefficient to something other than one, which is the default. But if you do that, you can no longer specify fluid modulus. You have to specify BO modulus or consolidation coefficient. And then if you recall when I said that the defaults have changed, the effective stress cutoff, saturated density, and pore pressure generation, you can change those. You can make the cutoff more negative. You can include saturation in the density calculation, and you, you can activate two-way coupling, and those are zone properties. So you can do that in specific areas of the model or everywhere or however you want to do it. Okay, now let's look at actually solving the model. So we're going to try and create our initial conditions for the start of a calculation. Uh, where something's changing. So we set gravity, we configure fluid flow on, we set a fluid density, we establish boundary, we use the skin command to name the far field. We establish boundary conditions. Here we're using the head, zone place apply head with the new cutoff keyword so that that's cut off at zero. Remember, we're still doing unsaturated flow now. So pore pressures can go negative. For the surface, we're using a new boundary condition called pore pressure maximum for the surface. The, basically this top of the model. What that does is, since we don't know exactly where the zero pore pressure line is going to be, we want it to be able to go negative, but we don't want it to go above zero um, because that's a surface. So this does that automatically for you. It sets a maximum of zero. If it's negative, it leaves it alone. And if it tries to go above zero, it fixes it. Um, there is some contention about how physically um, accurate or meaningful this boundary condition is. 
Um, if you need to use it, um, we recommend you switch to an unsaturated flow model, which I'm going to cover in a second. Um, but um, it's there if you want to use it. Um, we set the mobility coefficient, we set the fluid modulus, and now we can solve this by default explicitly, just like we did before. And you can see that happening here. We're just modifying the flow. Now, again, it defaults to an explicit calculation. And this will run to this time, which is somewhat close to the um, steady state solution um, in about uh, 20 seconds or something, which isn't bad, uh, but we can do better. If we stop that, we have a new command called zone fluid steady state, which just immediately calculates the steady state given the properties and boundary condition. So we can just run that from beginning to end and in one step calculate this steady state pore pressure field. Note that by default, the zone fluid steady state command again cuts off negative pore pressures because the feeling is that if you're just trying to establish a pore pressure field for effective stress, that's probably what you want. But if you do want negative pore pressures, um, which in this case we do because we're going to be doing a transient analysis later, um, we can turn them back on. And this pretty much gives us the exact same answer we were getting with the explicit, but just in one step. Um, and then after that, we would solve to mechanical equilibrium, um, which I can run this to do it. Um, and you can see it very quickly reaches mechanical equilibrium after using the zone initialized stresses command. Now, there's a couple of things I forgot to mention here, so I'm going to go back. I want you to look at this command, zone model solve fluid. This is new. Um, in the past, it might have been difficult, or it might you might have taken a couple of extra commands to do a, to to do a solve that only used one process. By default, when you turn both fluid and mechanical on, they're both got to happen in a solve command. To make that a little bit easier, we've just added some new solve commands. So model solve fluid does the fluid process only. Nothing else is happening, including mechanical. And if you look down here, model solve static does a static mechanical process only. Nothing happens in fluid. Just to make it a little easier to move from one process to another. OK, now let's look at an actual coupled analysis. So what we're going to do here is we're going to store our initial conditions. We're going to change the far field boundaries. So we're raising our water input from the far field here. And you can see that happen after I ran that command when I raised the head. Um, because we used a steady state, when you solve for a steady state field, fluid modulus isn't necessary. So I'm going to make sure there's a fluid modulus set. And, oh. Um, we're going to turn two-way coupling on, so this turns two-way mechanical coupling on. And now we're going to do what we call a, a coupled analysis, or maybe a loosely coupled analysis. This is the system where you take one fluid step and then cycle to mechanical equilibrium, and take another fluid step and then cycle to mechanical equilibrium, and so on. Sort of the gold standard in how to do a coupled fluid mechanical analysis. Um, because you're guaranteed that you're in mechanical equilibrium the entire time your flow field is changing. But it can take a very long time. Um, and even switching to implicit and other methods might not help that much because you might be taking a bigger fluid step, but that just means it takes uh, that much longer to, to come to mechanical equilibrium. So we are smart, though. It gets to a point where we take multiple fluid steps per mechanical step when the mechanical things aren't changing much. That said, this whole thing from beginning to end takes about 45 seconds. Um, for a really real model, sometimes we can't afford that kind of time. So there's another way that's typically done as a decoupled system, particularly in consolidation analyses, where you uh, you start from the same initial conditions, you make the same change to the boundary condition, you um, set your fluid modulus, but now we scale it because we're going to be running fluid by itself. So we're going to scale the fluid moduli to account for mechanical compliance, since that's not adjusting as we do our fluid calculations automatically. And now we're going to do a solve fluid decoupled. Now what this, do, this does is this does separate fluid and then mechanical calculations to get to a final time, but it doesn't in a given number of stages. I think the default number of stages is five. This was going to do it in eight. So it does a fluid for one third of the target, for one eighth of the target time, and then it solves mechanical equilibrium, and then it keeps doing that till it reaches the final time. And you can see that here. 
So you can watch both the stress field and the fluid field adjust as it goes through that series of calculations. And that will compress the amount of time this entire process takes a fair amount, especially on a larger model than this. Note, I'm doing this a model of this relatively small size because I, it helps to be able to do it interactively like this. All right, so so far we've done everything explicitly or with the steady state command, but we have made improvements to the implicit calculations as well. So let's go through that same solve fluid decoupled process again. But this time we're going to want to do, do the fluid part implicitly to increase the fluid time step. Um, in the past, uh, the problem with that is always, how do you set a proper implicit time step? How do you know what the right one is? What's gonna give you too much error? Um, what's gonna take too much time? So we have uh, added an, ex an experimental, but still pretty handy servo that automatically does this for you. Every time you do a solve, it starts out explicit and it periodically makes an error estimate. And if the error is below um, the servo metric, it will automatically switch to implicit. Well, it will continue to make error estimates and look at things like how many iterations it takes to converge. Um, and it, as it can, it will keep increasing the implicit time step. So uh, uh, if we run this now, uh, it should it very much speeds up the fluid part of the calculations. And you can see if you look at the command side here, um, it gives you a notice when it activates implicit calculations every fluid cycle. Implicit fluid calculation activated. Note that it automatically handles things like jumping to a big enough implicit step that it's actually computationally efficient compared to explicit steps, which are faster per step. Uh, so, okay, now it's time to discuss unsaturated flow. So far, everything we've done has been fully saturated. We've made improvements to this as well. Um, first off, we handle um, um, more than one saturation model. So by default, we're fully saturated. You use the zone fluid unsaturated command to activate an unsaturated model. And this can be done in dip. Um, you can have different unsaturated flow models at different grip points. I'll, um, again, it's a range, so this can be applied to each in grid point individually. And again, if you hit F1, you can see um, all of the options available, um, Brooks Corey here and what their relations are. So there are soil matrix suction models that typically relate negative pore pressures to saturation. Um, and we support, right now we support Brooks Corey, Gardner, and Van Genuchten, if that's how you pronounce that. Um, also, you can just use a table to, to make any relationship you want. Um, and if you, sorry, that thing, uh, if you look here, you can see this is an example of what the saturation suction curves look like. Works curry looks like this. It's typically an exponential relation in saturation. And the cutoff model, which was the only saturation model we used to have, um, just drops, right? Um, as soon as it gets to the cutoff, it immediately starts to unsaturate without any change in pore pressure until it reaches zero and then it's done. Similarly, you can look at um, zone permeability saturation, um, which relates saturation to a permeability factor so that the less saturated it is, the less permeable it is. Um, S shape is the default and that's what the default was before. You can turn it off, which generally means you're doing something with fish or you can use a table relation. Uh, the plan is to add more permeability saturation models here in the future. And you can see what those look like um, here, where this blue line is the S-curve and this is constant. But now that we have unsaturated flow, let's go back and do this, the same thing we were doing before, but in an unsaturated model. We'll bring back our pore pressure and our stress. Oh, and instead of stress now, I want to look at saturation. So. Um, we do the exact same thing we did before, except with a couple of a couple of modifications. First, we don't use that pore pressure maximum anymore. That is not necessary. We can just set the zero pore pressure on the surface. Now we turn unsaturated flow off, and we're just going to use the cutoff model. Again, we set mobility coefficient. Uh, 
and we can run that here. Now we've got a classic problem um, in doing unsaturated flow that there's a large difference in time scale between the evolution of the phreatic surface and the, time, the, the characteristic time of the pore pressure field underneath it. So since we're only interested in the steady state for this particular system, we can drop our fluid modulus low, unrealistically low, in order to increase convergence to steady state so that those two time scales aren't different. So instead of 1E9, we can do 1E5. And now we can solve for 1E4 to a much larger time. Now, before it was 1, now it's 1E4. That's because of how much time it takes for the phreatic surface to evolve. Um, and you can see that happening explicitly here. And again, this is going to take about 20, 25 seconds. But again, we can do better because the steady state command does work in nonlinear and saturated flow. So um, we can instead just run this here and it will, again, in one step, calculate that steady state phreatic surface and pore pressure field without having to do any, any, any solving at all. Um, other than you know this the steady state command. And now we can once again run this to mechanical equilibrium underneath it. So let's look at now that was for steady state. What about the transient? Um, well, we can also use start from that state. Do the same thing we did before, which is modify the far field. And we want to see what the transient is because of that change in the far field pore pressure. So again, we, we want to set a proper fluid modulus and we're going to scale it. Um, and you can see here that a few zones had the all the zones had their modulus scaled down a bit so that we can get a trans, you know, a transient without using the full fluid modulus. And then we can solve this again. Um, now, note our explicit time step is one e to the one e to the minus four, and we're trying to get to a time of three hundred seventy-five. So it'll get there eventually, but that's going to take a while. But we can do implicit solving with unsaturated flow models, including the cutoff model. And again, um, you can use the servo on that. And we're going to use the same one e to the minus four error. And now you can watch that both the fluid and the phreatic surface evolve. And the time step is already 0.7 instead of 1 e to the minus 4, so it's three, four orders of magnitude higher. Um, and while this will take, because of the amount of time it takes for the phreatic surface to move and our error limits, this will still take um, you know, about 30, 40 seconds per stage, but it's a lot better than 3 million steps it would have taken before. Um, and I want to note that um, because it's a nonlinear implicit solver, um, it can fail to converge. Um, the servo will drop the time step if it detects that errors are getting large. Again, it will also if it fails to converge, it also will back up that entire step, drop the time step and try again. So even if you get a failure to converge, it won't necessarily stop your computation. Um, and I and I would also like to say that both the servo and the implicit transient solver are still in active development and improvement. So as we get more experience with the servo, we'll get better at tuning the parameters that govern it. And we're already looking at maybe adding another parameter. Um, also, um, we're constantly looking at ways to improve the reliability of convergence, especially with regards to the cutoff model. Um, and there are improvements that are probably going to be released in either this 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 that will improve that even again. Um, and that's pretty much what I have to say about fluid relations. Um, now I want to talk about some other improvements we've made to FLAC 3D. Um, that some of which are tangentially relevant. Um, let's look at a different model. This is a modification of the excavation and saturated soil model. And I want to run this all the way down to here because I want to point out a change that was made.
A uh, null is no longer a constitutive model. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with this before. If you're doing multi-process things, it, it could be a cause of some confusion. When, when you nulled mechanically, it wasn't necessarily nulling in fluid calculations or vice versa. And that meant that since we defined the surface of zones as the surface of non-null zones, we had three different sets of surfaces, one mechanical, one thermal, and one fluid. We've gotten rid of that. Now there's just one set of surfaces. If it's null, it's null in everything. You can still set, as we do in this example, you can still set, um, like these concrete walls are set to inactive because they're impermeable and that still works. But if it's null, it's null in everything. Um, and it, it uh, greatly simplifies the calculations. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, another, improvement we've made, I think is best shown by looking at just straight up using one of the examples. So if I search for cylinder here in our wonderful exact examples dialog and pick uniaxial compressive strength and open it, it'll open up this example in a separate flat 3D window. And the reason why I'm bringing this particular example up is because this is an example of a parametric run where we are oops, some, this is the full documentation for that example again, where we are running the same model over and over and over again with different parameters to get an, uh, a sum of all of them. In the past, especially with fish, this was difficult. With Python, it was easier because you could set a Python reset state false, but that was persistent and could and could um, um, it would give warning messages because of model state issues, and it would keep going even if you ran another model later, which isn't necessarily ideal. So now if you do a model new or a model restore inside a fish function, it automatically recognizes that um, you're doing this sort of activity and it won't clear the fish state. So you can just do it and it'll work. Um, if you need to restore a bunch of files to pro for post-processing in Fish or Python, it will just work. If you need to do a parametric run like this, it will just work. We've added a skip keyword that let, let lets you be explicit about this. If it's happening inside a Fish or Python function, you don't need to, it does it automatically. But um, for instance, here you can skip table, which means that the table data is also not cleared or restored. And that lets us, for as in this example, collect a data on each run into a table so we can plot it later. And if you run this now, you'll you'll see that we're doing multiple runs just with this, just like an old data file. And each of these dots represent a separate separate example that was run to equilibrium, um, showing you where the failure is according to the ubiquitous joint angle. Shut that down, go back here. Um, another handy thing we've added for those of you who are using the Hope Brown is we've got a Hope Brown calculator now to help you. This is a wizard to help you pick Hope Brown parameters. Um, and you can not only get feedback on what these parameters mean, like pick from the table, um, you can um, interactively play with this to see where it goes and change values. Um, and then most handy, you can get commands here and if you switch back to flat 3D, you can just paste those into your data file to assign the Hope Brown criterion and get those properties. And then lastly, there are a number of other improvements that have been made that either I didn't have time to cover or uh, are difficult to show visually inside the code that I'm just going to mention right now. First off, as always, we work towards improving the speed of model creation and cycling, especially when they're very, very large models, which is more and more common now. So we've improved like um, the zone group command if you've got a very large model with a large number of cores. Um, we've also improved our user interface. Um, in the past, if you were running under Windows Remote Desktop, um, that uh, could degrade the performance of plotting. That is no longer a thing that happens. You should get native performance there. Among the other UI improvements that you've seen me use uh, um, as we as I did the fluid demonstration. Uh, we have made improvements to Python as well, and th these are going to 
be operating over time, connecting more and more of the code to Python and including more um, Python modules by default. And the latest is the Python can now is, is fully connected to the geometry logic and is, can use the contour PY module if you're doing your own plotting or other contouring. And lastly, um, everything I've shown you about fluid also applies to the thermal logic, except of course for uh, uh, nonlinear and saturated flow. But the, uh, the servo and the new commands, all of that applies to the thermal logic. And in addition, um, we've improved thermal fluid coupling if you happen to be doing that. Um, um, and from 9.0 to 9.1, that speed up. And there's an example called um, Horton Lapwood Convec Convection. You can look at it if you're interested. That's 12 times faster from 9.0 to 9.1, uh, which adds to a like a, a 10, 12 times faster we did from seven. Um, so that example used to be in its own category because it took longer than all the rest of our examples combined. And now it goes from beginning to end in uh, four minutes, 15 seconds, I believe, on modern hardware. So uh, that is what I'm going to cover today. Like I said, there are other things I didn't cover. And I want to continue to note that we are going to be constantly adding new things to this as we go along. Um, we're working all the time and they will be coming out in future point releases. Um, and now I'm gonna close for questions if anybody have them. Okay, we have a uh, couple questions. Um, I'll just read through them and um, if you could respond to them, David. Uh, okay. So we have a question, can evaporation or infiltration boundary conditions be applied on the surface? Um, yes, uh, you can specify a flux boundary condition on the surface. Um, if you're trying to do rainwater infiltration, you can do that too. Um, we have discussed making that a separate boundary condition um, because you have to be a little careful making sure that you don't apply so much flux that they actually create positive pore pressures on the surface. But, um, but yes, you can, is the summary. Great, thank you. Will all of these examples that you've gone through today be available in the software documentation? Uh, the bathtub model isn't an official documented uh, example. Uh, it was just something I threw together to show some stuff off um, in, a in a relatively small time um, live. Um, but uh, I am making it available to Dave, and if Dave wants to make it available to the public later, I have no problem with that. Um, all the other examples, as I said, are in the examples dialogue. So. Great. And yes, so uh, when we uh, send out an email with a link to this the recording of this video and the PDF of the presentation, uh, we'll include any uh, examples that aren't in the documentation, just as project files. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question. Uh, FLAC 8.1 had the command set fun sat on. Is there an equivalent now with the new fluid flow logic? Somebody remind me what set fun set did. It's been too long and I don't remember. Andre, do you remember? Um, I. We have Jen in the room. Yeah, set fun yeah. set is, uh, yeah, you uh, adjust the, uh, for the motor, you know, you know uh, for the uh, flow uh, calculation and you lower the uh, flow motor, and they run in the uh, uh, mechanical, set, uh, mechanical calculations. No, you keep keep doing that. No. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, it sounds like it's the same thing as modulus scale, but I'm not 100% certain of that. Yes, scale the okay. keep doing the yeah scale the water model uh, bucket model. Right. That sounds like it's the same thing as modulus scale. Yeah. So yes, then. Okay. Uh, next question. Sometimes we have multiple water tables in the model, separated by low permeability soil layers. When we use geometries to define these water tables in the plot zone water table, oh. only the last geometry is shown. Would it be possible to show all the water tables defined? Yes, and we do that differently now. So you can load them all up and plot them individually and separately if you want. And thank you for reminding me because I had a very nice example here that I forgot to show you um, in 2D of how um, effective the implicit calcul transient calculations can be. So I'm going to do that right now. Um, and it is, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's called a landfill example. 
and you can see, and the reason why I was reminded is because there is not only a perched boundary condition here, but if you look at the hydraulic conductivity, there's a four order of magnitude difference in here and this, this layer, um, causing a perch tape infiltration here from the left. Um, and if you run this explicitly, even with modulus automatic, you can see you get a time step of 3.5 e to the minus four, and we're trying to get to 3.5 e to the four. That's a eight orders of magnitude difference. That's going to take one e to the eight cycles explicitly. And so you can see here it, that it's doing something, but it's going to take a while. But if we switch this example to implicit and we turn the servo on, now granted the servo is, um, we're lowering the air here to 1 e to the minus 3, which is a little aggressive, but for the purpose of this demonstration, you'll see. Also, we're setting a maximum. But if you run this now, I would point out that this maximum is 100,000 times the explicit critical time step. And now you can see this evolve in real time. And you can watch the time step climb from 3 to the minus 4. It's already at 3. It's already risen five orders of magnitude. And as this evolves, it'll keep climbing and eventually cap out at 35. Um, um, I have already just today um, made an improvement to, that will eliminate the need for this cap. But um, if so that will, and the time scope will be able to get up another couple orders of magnitude. That should appear in either a six or seven update. So. So you can watch this happen in real time now, and the time step is nine, and eventually it will cap out at 35 before it gets to the end of the time period. Any other questions? Uh, yes, let me go back to the questions. And, and just to clarify for everyone, when David refers to version five or six, he's referring to the subversion. Oh yeah, uh, thank you, I'm sorry. Yeah. And quite one <laughs> zero point oh five or yeah. 06. And those yeah. are just like the regular, um, uh, minor improvement and bug fixes that you uh, normally get. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Is there improvements for PFC 3D when it comes to accounting for fluid at particle scale, especially for partially saturated cases where we have interface between air, water, and solid particles? Um, there are improvements being um, um, that are planned to be released with the 9.0 up release of PFC, which is expected sometime before the end of this summer, that include fluid flow support at the particle level. Um, I don't happen to know offhand whether that includes unsaturated flow. Um, we'll have to get back to you on that, but I know it's being done right now. Uh, a few more. Is it possible to assign permeability to liners? Uh, no, it is not. Not right now. Liners are always Im impermeable. Um, or if, yeah, all liners are always impermeable. Um, that is a thing we, uh, uh, it's on our list, but I don't know when or if it will show up. As always with Fisher Python, you can do anything. So in theory, you could do it with Fisher Python yourself, um, but it, it would be an effort, but you could do it. So anyway, go on. Okay. Uh, so we have a two-part question. One, will there be most structural elements available from FLAC 2D in PFC 2D? Uh, yes. Also, yeah. A general question. Can I install generally available Python libraries like Seaborn or Matplotlib for plotting? I can um, yeah. on this. Seaborn already, already implemented at that will be available from next update release. And also you can install whatever, you know, the package that, that can be okay. Perfect, thank you, Joe. Uh, question will, uh, and James is here, David, so I think he can address sure. this question. Will point versions be compatible with perpetual licenses? Is the task of transitioning away from perpetual licenses? Our plan is to support perpetual licenses, but we also have subscription uh, products. And subscription products will um, benefit from point releases uh, from this point forward. 
debate. Thank you, James. The generalized question, does Itasca code utilize GPUs? Uh, not for computational purposes, not yet. Um, 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 it, it is a thing in our radar. We actually, it's been on our radar for 15, 20 years, um, but we haven't, we, we've decided to work on other things as a better bang for the buck. At some point, I expect it will happen, but right now it does not. We do not. Thank you. Uh, we'll, is it correct that the zone dot model function will no longer be working for null C model? The zone dot model function will no longer be working for null C model. I, I mean, it's no longer constitutive model, so I assume. It oh, I mean, you again. We're fully data file compatible, so you can still say zone C model assign null, and that will do the same thing it did before, um, which is the same thing as saying zone null. Um, there is a zone null fish function now and a zone grid point null, I mean a grid point null fish function now. Okay, so let's see. We have one more question. Good afternoon. I tried to perform a fluid flow analysis on a very large model, about one kilometer by one kilometer, to check the effectiveness of a drainage system made of drainage wells. The analysis takes a lot of time. What advice could you give in order to get an equilibrium faster? After about four hours of analysis, I still hadn't reached equilibrium. Yeah, um, if you're interested in, I mean, with 9.1, if you're interested in the steady state solution, then you should be able to just use the steady state command now, and that will do it all without, you know, we'll just iterate until it gets converges to the steady state directly. So that would be my first suggestion. If you're interested in the transient, then there's a number of things. Again, we have implicit support now, um, including if if you're doing unsaturated flow. Um, also, there are um, modulus reduction you can do. Another thing I didn't mention here that is actually of note in this example is that when you when the time scale of the system is governed by the time scale of the, of the evolution of the phreatic surface, um, it's kind of a multi-scale analysis because the phreatic surface is moving slowly and the pore pressure field underneath underneath it is is essentially um, always in equilibrium. So um, it is valid to reduce your fluid modulus so that those time scales are are closer, like one order of mag one order of magnitude instead of four order of magnitudes apart. And that doesn't seriously affect your transient. Um, there is um, notes in the manual for how to calculate what those time scales are and how to do the adjustment. It's another command we're considering adding, kind of like modulus scale. Uh, you just have to be careful that you're sure that the phreatic surface evolution is what's dominating the time scale of your model. All right. Um, we are coming to uh, uh, the hour, uh, so I think we'll cut it off there. Uh, if we didn't get a chance to answer one of your questions or uh, if we're going to uh, follow up on some of the questions, we'll do so by email. Thank you very much for uh, participating and attending. Thank you, David, for uh, a great presentation. Um, again, uh, if you've registered, we will send uh, an email shortly with the final uh, recording, uh, PowerPoint, uh, slide deck, and also um, any examples that are in the documentation. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a good day and uh, take care.